so I'm Steve Upple. I lead All Nations Church in Wolverhampton, uh, which is uh, both the church in the center, of, the city center of Wolverhampton, but we have uh, about eight of the locations that are part of the same church, but congregations just within about a 10, 15 minute drive. Uh, and then we have a growing family of churches across the UK, uh, in America and over in India. So it's brand new. We're just learning what it means to be an apostolic family. Uh, married to Esther, and I have five children. I actually have four that are ours, and one that married one of mine, so he's mine as well now. So, Very. Yeah. And are you all in lockdown together? We are all in lockdown together, so there have been seven of us since March in the same house. Uh, my uh, daughter and son, who are married, uh, came back from university in March. My older, my next daughter, Dan, was at uni. She had come back in March. Uh, and it's been outstanding, just a really rich time of family together. So we, we consider it a gift. Can I, can I just ask you about that, just a little bit about your family in lockdown and, and sort of how you're, how you're doing that and what you're learning in this, in this time? Yeah, I, I think family's always been uh, pretty significant for us. So we always eat our meals together. We share devotions together. We pray together. Uh, and it's gone through seasons, so I wouldn't say in 20 odd years it's been every single season of life. But on the whole, you know, always eating our meals together, always sitting around the dining room table. Uh, but during lockdown, being very intentional about uh, we've got a daily devotional plan. Everybody shares a devotion uh, with my boys on a morning, uh, 8 a.m. every morning. We sit down together, we read. It actually came out of a request from them about four or five weeks ago. Uh, so me and them to sit together, pray together, read together. We discuss general stuff in life, but it's mostly about prayer and Bible study and also doing some scripture memory. So it's been rich in terms of family. I, I love that. And I think one of the things I've really admired, Steve, you know, about, about you, and I think it's not just in your leading, but also at, at home, is just the discipline, uh, the, the commitment to discipline. I don't know whether it just... Like we're not going to talk about this mainly, but it'd just be helpful maybe just to get a word from you on that about why by having disciplines like that, maybe the, the, the kind of scriptural stuff or the, the eating around the table, why are those things so important? Here's, here's what I've learned. Most people look for a remedy later on in life when something goes wrong in the marriage or in the kids or whatever it is. I've learned if you can go back and you can say, let's develop some habits and rhythms that will help us to have a happier, more fruitful life, whether it's in my health or whether it's in my marriage or with my children. It's better to establish those routines and rhythms than it is to try and rescue something later on in life. So that's the thinking behind it. Um, I, I've kind of changed the word for me, discipline, to the words habits of grace. People don't like discipline, but when they say these are habits empowered by God's grace, because we're not amazing at discipline, if we ask God to help us pray together, read together, eat together, uh, it, it actually leads to a happier home. So uh, a few people have said to me, seven people in your house, that must be crazy. How's it going? And I can honestly say it's been wonderful. And one of the reasons is I think we've done eating around the table, learning to have conversation for 20 years with the kids. If we can establish patterns and rhythms at any stage, it helps us into the next stage. Um, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, as we sort of think about this very strange season that we're in, um, this pandemic, none of us have led church through a pandemic. Um, I'd love to know what you're learning and uh, what you see as the kind of main things that God is teaching you both sort of as an individual, but I think also as a, as a leader of a church, I think it would be really helpful to hear that from, from your perspective. I would say firstly, and they're in no particular order as such, but I think I found that this season has been like a forced Sabbath. It, you know, I, my life was airplanes, trains, cars, uh, heavy preaching schedule, heavy traveling schedule. I go from that and the first two, three weeks of lockdown, I was in my element. We were problem solving. We were looking about everything that we had to do differently. So the adrenaline kicked in. But about two weeks after that, I was like, my life's just spoiled. I can't go to the gym. I can't do this. And there was a reorganization. I felt the Lord saying to me, it's far more about what I'm doing inside of you than what I'm doing through you. Um, so 
secondly, I would say, and this was about three weeks into the lockdown, I thought the Lord really kind of startled me with a revelation. This is a shaking that is meant to lead to an awakening. Mm-hmm. That he, he, the earth is shaking, Matthew 24, the birth pangs for the last days, and the, the shaking has an intent behind it. So some people, if I say that, would say, are you saying God caused the pandemic? I actually think there's four pressures at work in the world today. And off the top of my head, I haven't got my notes in front of me. I would say, you know, uh, yes, the father disciplines. uh, The enemy rages. The earth is shaking under the sin of centuries of sin that's been happening. And human beings um, have choices that they make. And those four things all cause the pressures in our world. And I would say I'm not smart enough to tell you which pressure is caused by whom. I do know that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He doesn't take delight in that. So I'd probably use the phrase that God didn't cause a pandemic, but he allows it. And there's a purpose behind it. He takes no pleasure in the loss of life. Uh, whether it's the sin of man, the raging of the enemy, or the earth groaning under the weight of centuries of sin. Um, I I think there's a shaking, and it's supposed to awaken us. And so I take that shaking very, very seriously. I feel like the Lord has got us by our shoulders, and he's saying, wake up to the church. Um, And Matthew 24, I I, I also think um, Jesus said these are the beginnings of birth pains. So... You could go right back to the First and Second World War, that, that gap of about 31 years. Um, 150 million people died, Spanish flu, two world wars. It was a crazy shaking. And there's been wars and stuff since then, but relative, in the West especially, relative quiet, prosperity. And now we've had this massive shaking, but it's not the first one. You know, uh, 2001, uh, in September 11, the Two Towers, that was a shaking. Uh, 2008, the economy that kind of had a bump in the road and it impacted us in the West. In the early 2010s onward, uh, HN1 flu, bird flu, uh, SARS, Ebola. Uh, and then you could look at what happened in the Middle East, uh, Syria, the rise of ISIS, Egypt overthrown, Libya overthrown. I mean, all of those are shakings. What normally happens to us in the West, we see it, we go, <gasps> and then we go back to sleep. I'm hoping this would cause the church to wake up Mm. and pay attention to the Heavenly Father. Wow, it's just so fascinating to hear you talk about the uh, awakening that is coming from the shaking that God is bringing. I think think another shaking that we're we're definitely seeing and experiencing just in this last week or so is the tragic death of George Floyd and the the ripple effects of that. Um, I, I just wonder whether you might respond to that for us but how do you see that as part of this uh, overall picture of what god is doing and how should we be responding i think it's obviously centuries old injustices in the states uh, people have been mistreated for a long time my daughter has just finished a law degree three years and part of one of her modules was studying the criminal the penal system in america Wow. And one of the states that she looked at, she said, Dan, this, this isn't a one of, uh, uh, you know, and the Americans know this and many of us know. She said, every single day, black people are being treated unjustly and nobody's dealing with it. Yeah. It's everywhere. So what we saw in this, it got caught on camera, which we could say, well, if, if that camera hadn't caught it, it probably wouldn't have blown up. So thank you to ever recorded that, to be able to say this is unjust, that somebody who should be protecting life took a life. It's, it's just like mind-boggling that that could happen. And his rap sheet, that, that police officer's kind of, um, he's been had before, been disciplined before, been let off from things that he shouldn't have been let off. I mean, just crazy without going into this. So what you're dealing with is, is hundreds of years of injustice Mm. And this one case, isn't, it isn't just this one case that people are dealing with. They're just saying enough is enough. Something yeah. has to be done. And there's a cry for justice. It's difficult for me sitting here saying what we should do because uh, I live in Wolverhampton. What do I do? I think, number one, I need to take up that cry for justice. I say, yes, you're right. I stand with all of those that are being unjustly treated and saying we want justice and this needs to be rooted out. Um, 
I, I think there's also a weeping with those who weep, that we need to feel the pain of this. It's not just a crying for justice in terms of a demand. And I, I hear what you're saying in the ripple effect, some people going violent, some people... I, that wouldn't be my way of dealing with this. I don't think that's helpful, pouring violence on top of something that's already violent. Uh, but we definitely weep with those who weep. And, and then as believers, I think the biggest thing that we do is to pray. We cannot pick up the weapons of the enemy and throw them back at him, accusation or hatred or anger or violence. While we do cry for justice and we can speak up and we need to feel it deeply, I think uh, people more than me are qualified in the place of law. I would say to them, you need to stand up and fight for this. Uh, so there is a fighting for justice, but I think in peaceful ways, but there can still be very strong ways. And then there's a praying that we as the followers of Christ should be doing, standing in the gap in the place of prayer. Yeah, yeah. And, and with prayer, I, I think also this reality that we need to check our own hearts for where we've been complicit in some of those systems, whether knowingly or unknowingly, and ask for forgiveness from God really for that. And, and just as we think about prayer, I know you will have been, I have been uh, praying very much for what the future would look like after COVID and how we respond as churches to that. Um, and my sense really uh, has been that it's not simply about a few adaptations uh, from, from this, but about a revelation of what God is doing and how he wants to move us on as his church um, in a in a brand new way, and I, I know you've got some insight and input into that. So we'd just love to hear just in these closing moments um, from you about that. Yeah, I, I think that the church is. Well, I don't think every church will embrace it, but I believe that the church is going through perhaps its biggest reformation since the Reformation. Wow. But a lot of people don't want that. They want to survive the the lockdown come out the other end, maybe keep online going, do some stuff in the building, adapt to a new way. But I think there's a fundamental thing God's changing. He's been speaking to us about new wineskins. Mm. And so, you know, Pharisees, then John the Baptist and his disciples come, and then Jesus comes. And then in Mark 3, they're saying, why is it that your disciples don't um, uh, fast like John the Baptist disciples and the Pharisees do? And he speaks about a new wineskin. There's a new day. There's something else. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't accept it. And it was the religious people of the day that couldn't get what God was doing. That was new. There was so much comfort in the familiar. They couldn't embrace a new thought or a new idea. I think that is happening right now. Many people are not asking the right questions or... They're willing to rearrange furniture on a sinking ship. And what God is wanting to do is a radical shift in what church looks like. So we've been wrestling for a number of weeks with the whole idea of a new wineskin uh, or a fresh wineskin. Lord, what is it? What are you asking from us? And, th and the Lord has been saying to us, be courageously creative. Be more prophetic than pragmatic. So there's a sense of don't just be pragmatic. Oh, we're going to go online and we're going to do it this way. And we think we're being really creative. And he's like, that's not creative. That's just pragmatic. You're going to communicate with your people. And it's going to take a boldness and a courage to really hear the Holy Spirit and then say yes to him, wow. which is what everybody did in the New Testament when they decided to follow this God man, Jesus. Yeah. They were saying no to their current synagogue Jewish culture or their Roman culture or their Greek culture or the Ephesus church or wherever it was. And they were saying yes to this man. So it's a radical shift. And I, I think the church is about to go through that. 